Section 20 of Four American Indians by Edson L. Whitney and Francis M. Perry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapters 10 and 11 of The Story of Tecumseh. Chapter 10. The Battle of Tippecanoe. In August in the year 1811, Governor Harrison sent stern speeches to the Indian tribes, threatening them with punishment if they did not cease their preparations for war and comply with his demands. On September the 25th, the prophet's reply arrived at Vincennes. He gave repeated assurances that the Indians had no intention of making war on the settlers, and he promised to comply with whatever demands the governor might make. To this message, Harrison sent no answer. The governor was now ready for action. He had a force of about a thousand fighting men. The militia were reinforced by three hundred regulars and one hundred and thirty mounted men under a brave Kentuckian, J. H. Davies, who wanted a share in the glory of an encounter with the Indians. Later, two companies of mounted riflemen were added to this force. Harrison sent a detachment of men up the river to build a fort on the new land. By this act he took formal possession of it. He felt his hands tied by the President's instructions to avoid war with the Indians if possible, and awaited developments with impatience. He expected the Indians to oppose in some way the building of the fort, and his expectations were at length realized. One of the sentinels who kept guard while the soldiers worked on the fort was shot and severely wounded. Harrison thought this might be regarded as the opening of hostilities, and determined to march upon the Prophet's town. A letter from the War Department received at about this time left him free to carry out his plan. It was late in October before the new fort, named Fort Harrison in honor of the governor, was finished, and the force ready to leave. Then Harrison sent some messengers to the Prophet, demanding that the Indians should return stolen horses to their owners, and surrender Indians who had murdered white men. He also demanded that the Winnebagoes, Potawatomis, and Kickapoos, who were at Tippecanoe, should return to their tribes. Without waiting for a reply, or appointing a time or place where the Prophet's answer might find him, Harrison began his march on Tippecanoe. Through the disputed land, the armed forces marched, on, on, into the undisputed territory of the Indians. Still they met with no opposition. Not an Indian was seen until November the 6th, when the troops were within eleven miles of Tippecanoe, and although many of them were seen from that time on, they could not be tempted to any greater indiscretion than the making of threatening signs in response to the provoking remarks of the interpreters. When within two miles of Tippecanoe, Harrison found himself and his army in a dangerous pass that offered the Indians a most inviting chance for an ambush, but he was not molested. When the troops were safe in the open country once more, Harrison held a conference with his officers. All were eager to advance at once and attack the town. They held that if there was any question about the right or the necessity of an attack, it should have been decided before they started. Now that they had arrived at the stronghold of the Indians, there was only one safe course, and that was immediate attack. Perhaps the circumstances of the march had persuaded Harrison of the sincerity of the Indians' plan for peace, and he felt that, after all, the affair might be settled without bloodshed. At any rate, he was almost reluctant to comply with the wishes of his aides. But at last, yielding to their urgency, he gave the order to advance and storm the town. Scarcely had he done so, however, before he was turned from his purpose by the arrival of messengers from the prophet, begging that the difficulties be settled without a battle. Harrison sent back word that he had no intention of making an attack unless the prophet refused to concede to his demands. He consented to suspend hostilities for the night and give Tenskatawe a hearing in the morning. Greatly against the will of his officers, who had no faith in the Indians' professions of friendliness, and saw that every hour of delay might be put to good use by the prophet, Harrison encamped for the night. He seemed to have had little fear of an attack, as he did not even fortify his camp with entrenchments. But his men slept on their arms that night, and although no sound from the Indian village disturbed the stillness, 
there was a general feeling of restlessness. Between four or five in the morning, in the dark that comes before the dawn, a sentinel shot followed by the Indian yell brought every man to his feet. As the soldiers stood in the light of the campfires, peering into the blackness with cocked muskets, they were shot down by savages, who rushed upon them with such force that they broke the line of guards and made an entrance into the camp. Had the number of assailants been greater, or had Harrison been less alert, they would doubtless have created a panic. But Harrison was already up and on the point of rousing his soldiers when the alarm sounded. With perfect self-possession, he rode about where bullets were flying thickest, giving orders and encouraging his men. The brave Davies, having gained Harrison's consent, recklessly plunged with only a few followers into a thicket to dislodge some Indians, who were firing upon the troops at close range. He was soon surrounded and shot down. The Indians fought with great persistence, and kept up the attack for two hours, during which the troops held their ground with admirable firmness. As day dawned, the Indians gradually withdrew. Harrison's situation was perilous. Counting killed and wounded, he had already lost one hundred and fifty fighting men. The Indians might return at any moment in larger numbers to attack his exhausted force. Provisions were low, and it was cold and raining. The men stood at their posts through the day without food or fire. All day and all night the soldiers kept watch. The second day the horsemen cautiously advanced to the town. To their relief they found it empty. The Indians had evidently fled in haste, leaving behind large stores of provisions. Harrison's troops helped themselves to what they wanted, burned the deserted town, and returned to Vincennes with rapid marches. As a result of the Battle of Tippecanoe, Harrison was the hero of the hour. News of the destruction of the Prophet's town carried cheer into every white man's cabin on the frontier. CHAPTER Eleven: REORGANIZATION OF THE INDIANS Of the six hundred Indians that Harrison estimated had taken part in the Battle of Tippecanoe, thirty-eight were found dead on the field. Though that was not a large number from a white man's point of view, the Indians regarded the loss of thirty-eight of their warriors as no light matter. But that was not the heaviest blow to the Confederation that Tecumseh and the Prophet had worked so hard to establish. Tippecanoe had been regarded with superstitious veneration as the Prophet's town, a sort of holy city under the special protection of the Great Spirit. The destruction of the town, therefore, seriously affected the reputation of the Prophet. It is hard to tell what part the Prophet played in the attack on Governor Harrison's forces. In their anxiety to escape punishment from the United States government, many Indians who were known to have taken part in the battle excused their conduct by saying that they had acted in obedience to the prophet's directions they told strange stories of his urging them to battle with promises that the great spirit would protect them from the bullets of the enemy on the other hand the prophet said the young men who would not listen to his commands were to blame for the trouble the fact that the indians did not follow up their advantage over harrison and instead of renewing the attack with their full force fled from him, would indicate that there certainly was a large party in favor of peace. It seems probable that that party was made up of the prophet and his most faithful followers, rather than of those Indians who, while pretending to be the friends of the United States and accusing the prophet, admitted that they had done the fighting. Tenskatawe had had advice from the British and strict orders from Tecumseh to remain at peace and he had shown in many ways his anxiety to appease Harrison and keep the Indians from doing violence. For some time the influence of Tenskatawe and Tecumseh had been more to restrain and direct than to excite the anger of the Indians which had been kindled by the Treaty of 1809, and was ready to break out at any instant. It is hard, too, to believe that young warriors, who had never been trained to act on the defensive, could be constrained to wait until they were attacked and so lose the advantage to be gained by surprising the enemy, or that they could be made to withdraw without striking a blow. 
but however blameless the prophet may have been he suffered for a time as harrison had supposed he would he was the scapegoat on whom all placed the responsibility for the battle of tippecanoe even tecumseh is said to have rebuked him bitterly for not holding the young men in check that tecumseh disapproved of the affair is evident from the answer he sent the british who advised him to avoid further encounters with the americans you tell us to treat or turn to one side should the big knives come against us had i been at home in the late unfortunate affair i should have done so but those i left at home were i cannot call them men a poor set of people and their scuffle with the big knives i compared to a struggle between little children who only scratch each other's faces in the spring, Tecumseh presented himself at Vincennes, saying that he was now ready to go to Washington to visit the President. The governor, however, gave him a cold welcome, telling him that if he went, he must go alone. Tecumseh's pride was hurt, and he refused to go unless he could travel in a style suited to the dignity of a great chief, the leader of the Red Men. Harrison soon learned that the brothers were again at Tippecanoe, with their loyal followers, rebuilding the village and strengthening their forces. In April 1812, a succession of horrible murders on the frontier alarmed the settlers. A general uprising of the Indians was expected daily. The militiamen refused to leave their families unprotected. The governor was unable to secure the protection of the United States troops. Panic spread along the border. Whole districts were unpeopled. Men, women, and children hastened to the forts, or even to Kentucky, for safety. There was fear that Vincennes would be overpowered. Had the Indians chosen this time to strike, they could have done terrible mischief. But Tecumseh's voice was still for peace. At a council held in May, he said, Governor Harrison made war on my people in my absence. It was the will of God that he should do so. We hope it will please the great spirit that the white people may let us live in peace. We will not disturb them, neither have we done it, except when they come to our village with the intention of destroying us. We are happy to state to our brothers present that the unfortunate transaction that took place between the white people and a few of our young men at our village has been settled between us and Governor Harrison and I will further state that had I been at home, there would have been no bloodshed at that time. It is true, we have endeavored to give all our brothers good advice, and if they have not listened to it, we are sorry for it. We defy a living creature to say we ever advised anyone, directly or indirectly, to make war on our white brothers. It has constantly been our misfortune to have our view misrepresented to our white brothers. This has been done by the Potawatomis and others who sell to the white people land that does not belong to them. End of section 20